think I'm going to just take a seat and do this if you guys don't mind. And uh, if you all don't mind, I'd like to this thing get too close to it. I guess it gets pretty loud, doesn't it? Um, I'd like to take a look at the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. We find that in Matthew chapter 20. And uh, by the way, I see a few people that uh, uh, I don't think I've seen before, and I'm grateful that you all are here. Uh, if I have seen you before, I guess my mind is getting old and I'm getting forgetful. But uh, we're grateful that you all are here. I'm certainly grateful because. Uh, you know, the pursuit of the knowledge of God's Word and the application of it to our lives, there's just nothing better for us. Um, Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is kind of concluding, or continuing a thought, not concluding, continuing a thought that he started with a little bit earlier. Has everybody got an outline, by the way? Okay. I'd like, actually like to start reading back in uh, Matthew chapter 19. We start in verse 23 of chapter 19. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So then Peter said to him, Behold, we've left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out ahead of and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And so they went. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day long? And they said to him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You go into the vineyard too. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Nor is your eye envious because I am generous. So the last shall be first, and the first last. It's, kind of, it's interesting how he, uh, this parable of the laborers is it's a, again a kind of a sandwich between this statement the first shall be last and the last shall be first what does the last shall be first and the first shall be last mean any ideas any comments the first shall be last and the last shall be first is he talking about the Jews and the Gentiles? Is he talking about those who are converted later in life versus those who have been converted earlier in life and lived a life for God for the duration of their life? Who's going to be first and who's going to be last? 
Any thoughts on that? That's true. And you see, so he's not thinking exclusively of those who are going to actually end up in heaven then. Many are called and few are chosen. Okay. Alright. I have no idea what he's talking about in that. Uh, the parable to me is talking about those who, uh, I mean when you look at it on the surface, he's uh, talking about those who, such as at my age or something, if I being converted later in life and, you know, getting to reap the benefits of heaven because of out of faithfulness and obedience to God. The same as those who have done so all their lives, whether they were converted as a teenager or a young person or whatever. But that's, I mean, that's when you're looking at the surface of it. Yes, ma'am. And, it, and, it, and it's the idea that we don't get into heaven by our works. Well, yeah, that's, that, that's the point of it. No, no. Our work's important, though? Faithful obedience. Mm -hmm. James chapter 2, perhaps? Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any comments or questions? Okay, if you want to follow along in the outline, thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that. Stuff for me to digest. Uh, the parable is an explanation of what we read prior to reading the parable, obviously, verses 23, 23 through 30 of the previous chapter, where Jesus is dealing with uh, trying to teach his apostles, and Peter raises a question, well, what's going to be for us? We've left everything and come to you. So what's in it for us? I mean, that's kind of a natural reaction, isn't it? What's in it for me? I mean, I've, I've dedicated myself to you. And when you go to work for someone, is it not the same? What's in it for me? Well, it's a paycheck, buddy. This is what you get if you do the work. You know, it's basically the same principle that Jesus is trying to explain to him. You know, it's the attitude towards what you're doing and, and the faithfulness in what you, how you're doing it. And then when you notice in this, uh, in verse 12 of chapter 20, the last guys, you know, when they, when they get the... When they get their pay, they go, well, uh, this guy only worked an hour. And yet he gets the same thing, and we've been sweating all day long. What's the deal here? It's a horribly difficult concept for the Jews to grab onto because they have been God's chosen people for many hundreds of years, and then here comes the gospel, good news, and that all men are pre-painted people, so to speak, but America kind of but, but everybody has the same uh, um, uh, um, avenue to, to heaven, and all of a sudden, all these Greeks have, this, have the same ability to have the same position in God's kingdom as I do. Oh, yeah, we, we, see, we see that being addressed a lot in Paul's epistles, where the Jews are trying to force the law on the Gentiles and uh, even in, I believe it's Acts chapter 17 where they follow Paul around to, from Thessalonica to Berea and stuff and trying to incite people to run him off because they didn't, you know, the Jews were so opposed to the gospel in, in that instance, but uh, they were very jealous of the Gentiles as well. And that's not too difficult to figure out. This uh, parable teaches that the rewards will not be determined by accidental circumstances. It's not going to be an accident that any of us or anybody makes it to heaven or doesn't make it to heaven. It's going to be a choice. It's going to be, it, it's certainly not going to be, wow, I'm surprised, I'm here. It's 
That can be determined by accidental circumstances as to the priority of time in the kingdom. That's what this parable is teaching as well. As to being a Jew, as Ruth mentioned, the Jews were expecting exclusive honors in the kingdom. They've been God's chosen people for a lot of years. Because they were the seed of Abraham. They, uh, when you read when Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees and the scribes a lot, that they tended to forget that they fell away an awful lot and the, king, the, the Jewish economy was destroyed and then there was a remnant that came back and that was a promise that God had made to Abraham and to David. And here we see it being fulfilled as Jesus was teaching in the first century here. The Jews weren't buying into it, even though they knew they were expecting the Messiah. They're still expecting him. He's already been here and gone. It's interesting how Jesus teaches, is what it is. He, he, he's teaching that God is not a respecter of persons here, in a sense. If uh, like I mentioned earlier, somebody's been a Christian all their lives and then someone like me is converted at an older age. It's, they've been converted. That's the point. Doesn't matter how long, it matters your service to God, your attitude towards God, your taking advantage of that grace that God extends to us through Jesus, through obedience to Him. Any questions or comments? Okay. Number two here, uh, we're going to look at the application of some of this stuff, and I know it's uh, uh, pretty simple to figure out, but the landowner represents Jesus, as we know, in the marketplace is the world, and the laborers represent those who are lost, and the vineyard represents the church, and a denarius is obviously a fair wage, a reward for a day's work. You have to think of that in terms of a reward for a day's work. When you go to work for someone, you get paid for a day or for a week, that's your reward for the service you rendered to that person that you're working for, that company that you're working for. So the landowner went to hire the laborers for his vineyard in number three here. Jesus hires men to labor in his vineyard, basically. And I put quotes on hire. Obviously, it's not hire. And the laborers are all adequately paid. You know, we're in a unique time in history here. Now I think about it. We aren't forced to work anywhere. We're not forced to, well, your daddy was a carpenter, you're going to be a carpenter. Your daddy was a coal miner, that's what you're going to do. No, we have a choice. And in the same sense, we have the choice to either do the work that God has for us to do or not to do that. We have the choice to work for our employer or not to work for our employer. If we don't work for our employer, then we're not going to be working for our employer. That was the way it was with me <laughs> when I was an employer. If you didn't want to work, well, I could accommodate you real quick. And it's the same in the kingdom of God. If you don't want to obey his will, if you don't want to do the work, these guys labored in the vineyard. You notice here, these guys are grumbling. We work all day long through the hot of the day and stuff, and these guys only worked an hour. But the point is, is they were doing what the landowner wanted. And it's the same in the... I, I tend to think in terms of, or try to make parallels to something that makes sense to me, and that's when I was working or had a company and people worked for me. It's, uh, if people were dedicated to what I was trying to accomplish and therefore make our customers happy, well then, you know, it worked out pretty well. And if that wasn't the case, then it didn't work out so well. Uh, and when it comes to our service to God, it, is it not important that we obey His will to participate in that grace? Jesus says it is. James says it is. In James chapter 2, faith without works is what? Alive? It ain't alive. It's dead. So we have to be careful in, in the way we handle God's Word and the application we make to ourselves. We uh, 
we don't want to delude ourselves like some workers would do in, in the workforce and take advantage of things and just be idlers or lasers or I don't know, is that a word? And number two here, the Lord Jesus all invites everybody to work in his vineyard. And we can read about that in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, and chapter 28, 19 and 20. And in Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16, most of us, or all of us, are pretty familiar with all these passages here. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17, and I don't know if I am familiar with that. I know what 18 and 19 say, but let's see what Revelation chapter 22 verse 17 has to say. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Come. He invites everybody. When Jesus gave the Great Commission to his apostles and we read about Matthew chapter 28 and Mark chapter 16. What's he tell them to do? Go into part of the world? Go into a little bit of the world? Go next door and preach? What's he tell them to do? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 Jesus states the conditions of salvation right there. Who he believes and is baptized shall be saved. Who he believe, who you believes not shall be condemned. And number three here, Jesus hires laborers. What does it suggest that uh, in this parable he's talking about laborers, not sitters? <laughs> Working not idlers. He's not hiring bosses either. He's hiring laborers. Who's the boss? Jesus. It's his will. And in number four here, the Lord Jesus hires people to labor as he directs and not as they may happen to choose. Is this applicable to us today, or was this just a first century anomaly? I would say, it, your point earlier about how in America we have a lot more choice, uh, but in India, Mark's preaching to day laborers every day, and they are, they don't go out and work in the fields. That's a lot like it was back then, no. Right, right. So we're, but, but, but it's still a thing. It, it certainly is. Uh, I was uh, giving some thought to that when, when you kept telling, when it kept being announced, you know, that all these people being baptized as they heard the gospel. I was thinking, those people just haven't heard it. They haven't been polluted by all this weird stuff that uh, people teach today. and They're gladly receiving it, kind of like when you look through Acts chapter 2, and about 3,000 were, were saved that day, and Jesus was adding daily such as would be saved in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. And I just think, man, how thrilling that was. And then when you try and teach people today, it's, no, no, you believe one way, I believe another. Well, the Bible says one way. And I hope I'm getting it right. I, I really study to make sure that I am. Or, I, you know, I try to be very diligent about that. But uh, it's it's a different environment that Mark's preaching in, and you know, I'm I'm so thankful for their success over there because it helps inspire me to teach others when they keep, you know, tell them, well, no, 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 I'm waiting for Jesus to come back and reign a thousand years and stuff. No, no, I don't need that. Um, it's it's. 
I just, it would be nice if that environment existed here today. There is. We just have to think about how to, how to make it work using the Word of God. Well, the Word of God is living and active and sharpening the two-edged sword and able to dig in there and divide between soul and spirit, isn't it? Number, oh, any comments, questions? No? Oh, it is? <laughs> yes, you forgot. Okay, the landowner hired laborers to labor in his vineyard, and uh, there's a specific vineyard that he hired them to work in. It was his vineyard. It wasn't uh, he didn't hire them to go into his competitor's vineyard. He didn't hire them to go wherever they felt like they wanted to work. He hired them for a specific task in his vineyard. Jesus doesn't hire laborers to work outside of his vineyard. He doesn't hire laborers to work in some other vineyard. The Lord Jesus hires laborers specifically for his vineyard. And the landowner should have been under no obligation to pay the laborers had they worked in some other vineyard. Now think of it in, the, in terms of if you're working for someone and you decide, well, I'm not going to work here today. I'm going to go work somewhere else today. Do you, who's going to pay you? Obviously not the person that you should have been working for. Jesus preaches a lot of common sense stuff when you really think about it, doesn't he? Jesus has not promised to reward anyone for work done outside his vineyard. And If you would, turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 3 and let's take a look at verse 21. To him <clears throat> be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. It's him. I think I got the wrong verse here. Oh well, forgive me for that. In uh, B here, Jesus has not promised to reward anyone for work done in another vineyard in uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 13, which we're real close to anyway. We find that Jesus says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. Okay? got to be one that's working in his vineyard or it's going to be uprooted. And if we look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 I think that's what I was looking for before anyway. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. It's his vineyard. the Lord will not excuse one for being in an uh, unscriptural church. Do you think uh, this is kind of a sensitive question for a lot of people or a sensitive thing for a lot of people? Uh, there's, there's a lot of religious people out there who think that everybody's going to be going to heaven. Does the Bible teach that? Does this parable teach that? No. Quite the contrary. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, and I know Paul's dealing with the... Uh, he's dealing with the Greeks there. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, 
God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. And in verse 32, here's the reaction of these guys. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. And we discussed this, I think, last week. People will hear what they want to hear and they'll obey what they want to obey. But when Jesus sends people into his vineyard, it's to do his work. And if they want to go out there and he, he wants them to pick grapes or he wants them to pull weeds, I mean, if they decide that, well, no, that's not what I want to do. Is that what working in his vineyard is? Is that what that means? No. He is the boss. He's the head. It's his will. And so I would suggest that uh, if we're not certain whether we're doing it his way, that we do as he inspired Paul to write to the, to the young preacher Timothy, study or be diligent or do your very best to show yourself approved unto God as a workman who needs not be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. We find that in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And I would say that that's, uh, there's, there's nothing in there that says that uh, when you feel like it, or if you feel like it, or when it's convenient, it's work. It's just like anything else logical in this life. If we're going to be successful, it takes effort. This doesn't come on you just like, okay, all right, you're successful. And on the back side of this page, uh, the landowner hired laborers at different hours. And the first laborers were hired at a stipulated price, and the laborers hired at the third, sixth, and eleventh hours had no agreement as to the amount of pay that they would receive. And the hiring of laborers at different hours is analogous to the different times in life that people obey the gospel. And I never really gave much thought to that. I, was, uh, I, I wasn't raised in the church and I had no concept of God or, or that stuff until I was about 20 years old. And then my wife and her parents, uh, she wasn't my wife at the time, but they started teaching me. And I thought, wow, okay, I never knew this stuff. So it's been 30-some, yeah, 30-some years ago and, and uh, I never really gave much thought to the idea that, you know, if someone was converted at the age of 70 or 60 or close to the end of their life, but I don't think that would ever bother me, but apparently it may bother other people. I don't know. But I know the parable speaks to that, that uh, maybe I should have more standing in the kingdom of heaven since I've been a Christian longer. No, that isn't what Jesus is teaching. Remain faithful until death, until... I mean, from the time that you are converted, truly converted, until the time that you're dead. You have that promise. So, the parable suggests that others don't learn and obey the gospel until later years in their lives. And, and the important thing is that the laborers are all hired, hired in the same day. This point in time. This is that day. This last time that we're in. And when time is up, is there going to be a chance to go, well, wait a second, Lord, let me go get baptized. When Jesus comes back as a thief in the night, is there going to be any time to go work in his vineyard? Not a chance. It's over. When Jesus comes, Peter talks about it in, first, in 2 Peter chapter 3, where when he comes back, it's over. The present earth, the heavens and the earth are reserved for fire. They're going to be incinerated. And those that are his are going to go with him. Everybody's going to go to the judgment. So today's the day. I don't think we're going to finish this, are we? <laughs> okay, number five here. The work to be done in the kingdom must be done today. 
And that's the point we were just making. Not tomorrow, and you're certainly not going to do it after you're dead. You had your hand up, George? Uh, you're on to another subject. No, go ahead. Well, you were talking about doing it today. Jesus told another story about some food for yeah. the leaders of the last minute. And they got locked out, didn't they? You didn't even know them. No, depart from me. Well, what's he say in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23? Then I will say to them, all those people that say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? He says, then I will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. I thank you all for the class. Is there any uh, comments or anything else? Thank you. I know it's time to stop. I don't know who's doing the invitation, right? Do you know who you are? Okay. I guess that's... You're in the know. Again.